Well, well, thank you very much. Um, I've got to admit, after 19 years of, of being an English teacher I, and standing in front of a, a, you know, groups of kids every day, I find this really intimidating. So it's probably quite useful that I start off with a very um, apt simile I feel about as nervous as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. Um, probably even more so because, you know, I can see some of the people here, I've taught your sons and so forth. <laughs> I apologise for anything like that. <laughs> There's a few, a few here. Um, uh, so very briefly, a tiny bit about me. Yes, I've just left John McGlash and that's fine. I started my teaching career in Moscow. Um, in school number 44, that's when I became an English teacher. And school number 44 was far better than school number 45. Um, and after that, this was in the mid-90s, um, and I came back to New Zealand uh, after that. I did my, my, sorry, I did my bachelor's degree here. I studied Russian. So um, I'm the world's worst, worst qualified English teacher because I've never studied any English at all. But uh, I did my teacher training in Invercargill, so hello to Invercargill, um, and spent five years at Kavanagh College, uh, and then uh, up sticks and moved to London, and so, uh, spent some time teaching in London. Um, realized that I don't have skills in breaking wild horses, so I uh, took a break from teaching, but did three years teaching uh, in a grammar school in Kent, and then came back to Dunedin uh, for McGlash. So that's sort of a very brief history of me, and all of that time I've, I've been teaching English and media studies and some Russian. So that's sort of um, a little bit uh, about me. Um, and so what we intend to do today is uh, talk briefly about the, whole, the structures around NCEA, um, why uh, it, it's difficult and challenging for kids coming from high schools into universities, some of the um, challenges they face as a result of a, a transition. So the metaphor that Naomi and I have come up with is, is moving ponds. And we see it at, at, at high school, there, there, there's your high school uh, pond over here. There's all your little fish, all your little friends, all your teammates, your classmates. And the little fish up there is transitioning out of school into university. And for many students, this is what university feels like. Sort of a big empty pond that actually can be quite lonely. And when you think of the size of most high schools in New Zealand, even, even the biggest schools have got maybe a year 13 group. Year 13 is form seven, um, if, you, if, you, if that's of, of help to people. Uh, uh, a year, year 13 group of around about maybe 200 people. Um, and so most schools around Dunedin have got year 13 groups of about 75. So going from a group of 75 into first year of university, it feels like an enormous challenge. So that's, that's the metaphor that Naomi and I have chosen, um, moving ponds. And this is briefly what we'll, uh, what we'll talk about today. Um, I'll talk uh, about some of the, the, the aspects of NCEA that uh, you know, um, uh, can have an impact on the students when they come to tertiary level. Um, I'm a, a big fan of NCEA. I think it is a fantastic system. Um, I understand that it, it, uh, it can work very well, it can also have weaknesses. So we'll talk about strengths and uh, what can actually happen within the system to uh, create a perceived weakness, especially when students come to tertiary level. There's a number of examples that, and stories that I'll, I'll uh, introduce along the way. Um, and uh, we'll move on later, we'll, we'll look at the sort of the differences between the two ways of learning and ways of assessing that might be um, relevant as uh, they come into first year university. And uh, the, Naomi's expertise here is bridging the gap to tertiary and looking at transition pedagogy. So that's um, where we'll uh, um, take the, the presentation. I thought uh, it's probably useful to, to have a, a, a brief look at the New Zealand curriculum. The New Zealand curriculum has around about uh, 96 pages. Um, but it's all summarised there on, on that one particular slide. And so I'll sh show you a little bit about where NCEA actually fits in there. So there are, there's a, a vision for young people who will be confident, connected, actively involved, lifelong learners. Now, of course, no one's going to disagree with that. We'd want that for young people. So there's lots of things that, that um, sort of underpin the actual learning intentions that happen in high school. Uh, so we've got values such as excellence, you know, why would we disagree with that? Um, innovation, curiosity, uh, respect, there's key competencies like thinking, um, uh, using language, uh, symbols and text, uh, working with others. Um, there's different learning areas listed there and achievement objectives. Now all out of that, uh, it's so flexible, the school designs its own curriculum. Um, I think the point was made over here that there's such variability, we don't know what students have actually studied because they don't go through a uniform process in high school. Um, I know that at the school I've uh, just come from, uh, we have had uh, year 12 and 13 students for the last at least five or six years. No two students have done identical courses. By that I mean they might have done identical subjects, but within the subject there's still such flexibility around what achievement standards a student might do or what tasks a student might complete. So they, they have identical qualifications, 
but they've, they've had a very varied um, and individualized um, uh, approach. And I think that's probably key for lots of schools, this idea of personalized and individualized learning. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that would have an impact on many first year courses. So um, out of that, the there's the school curriculum. And if we imagine there's a timeline here, there's like uh, five-year-olds here and there's 18-year-olds here, year one, two, three, all the way up to 13. Um, NCEA is this little bit here, years 11, 12, and 13, typically. Some schools might do a little bit of NCEA in year 10 or fourth form. Um, and out of that, that, that that's, but there's your qualifications for assessment. So that's NCEA. There's also, up at this end as well, um, a school might choose International Baccalaureate. Uh, I think there are about 14 or 15 schools in the country who do that. Uh, a school also might choose Cambridge. Um, so there's that there. NCEA is, is one of those three qualification systems, and it's by far the most, the most common. Uh, most schools, if they do run IB, International Baccalaureate, they also run NCEA as well, and students can choose which qualification pathway they, they wish. So that's just sort of an idea. There's a, the whole New Zealand curriculum, but NCEA is this tiny bit down here. Um, and it's really easy to have the perception, because the media does this really well, that um, NCEA is a program of teaching and learning. And it's not. It's a program of assessment. Um, and the, it is just what, cause what's supposed to do, happen is, of course, there's some teaching goes on, some learning takes place, then it's assessed. Um, and it's really easy, um, we'll explain it in a few minutes' time, how that can be sort of skewed by uh, teachers and students being very pragmatic. Okay, so there's a summary there of, of what NCEA is. Um, I'm guessing that this will be familiar to many of you, if not through the media, then maybe you've got children going through the system at the moment or, 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 or about to. Um, so each uh, subject is split up into achievement standards. An achievement standard specifies a skill. And we'll look at some examples in just a minute. Some achievement standards uh, specify content. This is particularly um, uh, obvious in the sciences where there are achievement standards that describe um, students must show understanding of or organic chemistry, something or other. I don't remember the rest because I'm not a chemist. Um, but generally, an achievement standard is a skill. Uh, so examples coming up. And so each skill is worth credits. Um, and to achieve your NCEA, the whole National Certificate of Educational Achievement, you need 80 credits at each level. Typically, uh, a course at high school would have about 24 credits in it. So most students would do five or six subjects. Um, you know, 24 multiplied by six is over 100. Um, so you'll notice my mathematical precision here. Um, so it's really attainable to achieve that 80. There's, there's you know, ample opportunity um, for that. Um, you, you probably have, have heard of uh, to pass, you, you get an achieved grade. Um, if you pass well, you get a merit grade. If you pass very well, you get an excellence grade. Typically, excellence is roughly the top 10 to 15 percent of students. Uh, merit would uh, sort of uh, maybe perhaps take it down to, uh, you know, the, within the top maybe 20 to 25, 26 percent of students. Um, the other grade that you can get is not achieved. Well, you haven't met the standard. There's no minimum standard. So nobody gets you know, 23 percent. Those uh, teachers don't talk like that anymore. There's not, you haven't sort of just failed. If you don't reach the standard, you've not achieved. You could have missed it by a mile, or you could be very close, and your grade is the same. So that's, um, that's probably um, you know, fairly familiar to you. Now, where, where I think is probably a really key issue for tertiary is this. University entrance uh, is a, a qualification. Um, and uh, the university entrance literacy and numeracy requirements are part of that. I'll break that down in, uh, a, a little bit more uh, in, in very shortly. Um, but that's um, uh, something we'll, we'll definitely look at because I know that that has an impact on what happens at university. I think a good point to remember is, is this last one here. The purpose of NCEA is not to get kids to university. That's one of its purposes. Um, but there are a whole, th there's thousands of achievement standards. Uh, many to do with the workplace, including, you know, say, you know, food handling, uh, health and safety. Uh, students can do courses in quad bike safety, all of that sort of thing. It's part of the New Zealand qualifications framework so that we can all, you know, everyone in New Zealand taking part in the system can add to the qualifications and still have them recognised under the same umbrella. Because that's what NZQA stands for, the New Zealand Qualifications Authority. So they oversee all of that and throughout anyone's career, you know, you, you can um, add different skills, get different achievement standards or different unit standards that contribute to your portfolio of skills. Um, 
And so we'll look at some examples, and then I'll come back to a point that was, 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 was raised earlier. So um, I'm going to stick with examples from English, because I can probably speak about that with, with most confidence. Here's a, a part of an English assessment matrix. Um, this is not a program of teaching and learning. This is just a program of assessment. And this is what I want to show you. One of NCEA's great strengths is its coherence. Um, this, this column here is level one, year 11 or fifth form, re replace school certificate. This column here, level two, this column here, level three. And these individual boxes are titles of achievement standards. And uh, if you can read them, hopefully you can see that this is a skill. So if we look at um, level one, 1, 1.1, show understanding of a specified aspect of a studied written text with evidence. So that's an external exam. Uh, so students are required to write an essay about some literature that they've studied. Um, a similar skill at level two, but look at the step up from level one to level two. Instead of show understanding, it's analyze a specified aspect. And the step up to level three, respond critically to a specified aspect. So you can see that there is a plan, a coherent plan, to help students demonstrate um, increasingly complex skills throughout the three years as they go through high school. There is, uh, and and that, that sort of coherence uh, is, is pretty much there across all of the school subjects. Um, probably the, the slight exception is the sciences because many of the science achievement standards specify content. And you can see that all those English ones there, you could read them all if you're enthusiastic enough to, um, and realize there's no content specified. Shakespeare isn't specified, poetry isn't specified there, uh, but the, there's a whole range of skills that these achievement standards can be used to assess. Um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll move on. Right, let's have a look at one individual achievement standard. And I've picked one that's actually a very important one because it's part of UE literacy. So this is a level two English achievement standard. Um, each achievement standard is roughly two pages. So there's this bit and there's some explanatory notes that come with it. But I've just taken, this, this is what students care about most because this, this will be on the front of their assessment. Look, this is the standard. Have you reached these particular... Uh, uh, standards, have you met these criteria? So to get the achieved, and there's the merit and there's the excellence, this is the achievement standard uh, for writing. Uh, can you write uh, accurately, coherently, um, that, that sort of thing. So to get achieved, you must do both these bullet points. The, there are two achievement criteria. Many achievement standards have one achievement criterion, but this one has two. So they must produce a selection of writing, um, and this bit here, it must be controlled writing. So this specifies it must be accurate as far as spelling, punctuation, grammar, paragraph, and all of that thing. You know. And you can see that within one achievement standard, um, we've got a step up. So there's the, the achievement level. To achieve with merit, you must do it convincingly. To achieve with excellence, you must do it effectively so that your writing commands attention. So there's a coherence within the grades rather than, well, you know, to get an A, you must get 80% or whatever, you know, uh, there's no numbers attached to this. And you can go through every achievement standard, hopefully. Um, I haven't checked this, there's just too many of them. But you, you should be able to see that step up. So that's one of the strengths, I think, of NCEA. Yeah, there's a coherence over the three years, and within each standard, there's, a, there's a, an obvious step up. Okay, and what the teachers have to do is look at students' work holistically and decide, does it meet this? Or is it convincing? Or is it effective? And does it command attention? Okay, that's what, that's what teachers are looking for. And I'll, I'll maybe say a little bit more about this example here. Teachers get asked this a lot, English teachers. How many errors am I allowed in my work? And they're, well, there's no number attached to that. You can't have 12 errors, and then 13 is a fail, but 12 is a pass. It's not like that. It's a holistic examination of the student's work. And that it will be different from uh, many ways of assessing at tertiary level, that idea of, of, of holistic. So students can achieve this, even though they might not have a really strong command uh, well, and precision of uh, language, vocabulary, punctuation, syntax. It might be a little bit clunky. You know, th they still could achieve there. Um, they might not convince you if they're a little bit clunky uh, and, and, you know, with, with a few errors here and there, um, but they still could achieve. Are there any, do, do just sing out if there's any questions at all, otherwise I'll just keep going. I can go for days, I think, on this. So th there's an, an, an achievement standard. So um, there's a, a, I mentioned a, a bit about some of the strengths of NCEA. I think we'll, we'll, uh, come, we'll dwell a bit on the first one, this idea of flexibility, um, because um, it was uh, raised earlier. Any teacher in New Zealand, 
teaching their particular class can choose what achievement standards to use. Uh, typically, there are about 10 or 12 achievement standards per subject, per level. But you wouldn't assess all 12. Most teachers would assess about five or six. Maybe three internally assessed standards and three externally by examination. So roughly that would be sort of typical. Three internals, three externals per subject. Um, but as each individual teacher's choice, or the head of department's choice, what standards get used. Um, if I can just go back, let me go back a little bit to here. Um, this, this particular standard here is very useful. This is deliver a speech. Um, it could be assessed completely on its own, give a speech on whatever topic, invent a suitably you know, brilliant piece of oratory and perform it. That could be your task. Um, what teachers can do and often do is sort of double dip a little bit. We might be studying uh, a, a, a text, we might be studying Macbeth for example, and Macbeth could be assessed using 2.1 there, written text exam at the end of the year, but students might also do some other learning about Macbeth and to demonstrate that learning they might deliver a seminar or a speech about Macbeth. So there's all sorts of flexibility there. Um, I know too, uh, in, in many, many classes, teachers give students the choice of which achievement standard they want to be assessed against. Um, PE teachers do this really well. Um, I've, I've done it myself too and many times in my English courses, uh, given the students a choice, okay now we've done some learning, we've done some learning, we've done all these things, now you need to do some assessment. And this is becoming increasingly common in, in a whole wide range of, of subjects in schools. Um, so now we've done us some learning. Now what do you want to be assessed against? You can choose one of the following achievement standards. And I've had some students present a graphic novel, or like a, an extract from a graphic novel, as their assessment. A different student has chosen to write an essay to assess the same piece of learning. Um, and they've chosen a particular achievement standard. Then they've chosen a product. What will they hand in? Um, very rarely do students, in my experience, um, choose to hand in um, an essay or a written report. Um, often, but can I do it as a uh, seminar to the class? Yes. Can I do it as a one-on-one -on -one interview because I'm too nervous to do a presentation in front of the class? Yes. Can I video myself at home and send you the video file of me um, you know, holding my dog while I'm, I'm presenting my learning to you? Yes, you can do that. NCA allows for all of that. And that's both really good uh, because it helps students demonstrate the particular skill in their own way. Because you see all, all those skills, uh, you know, such as you know, delivering a speech, there's plenty of times when a speech is delivered to nobody uh, except a camera in real life. Um, it's uh, probably most common if people are actually giving a speech in real life to do it, at, for example, at a wedding or a funeral or something like that. That's when we typically would, would be giving speeches most often. Um, I know of uh, one school uh, that uh, the head student gives a speech at prize giving. That speech can be assessed for NCEA, and that student can get credits for that, um, which, is, which is great. And usually the, usually the kid gets excellence because he or she doesn't have a choice. The 700 people there um, are wanting them to do well, so you know, they do it really well. So in, you know, NCEA is, is enormously flexible uh, like that. Um, I think the, the transparency is a really important point. The NZQA website um, is, if you uh, want to browse around it, it's really easy. You can see all past exam papers, exemplars of uh, last year's um, achieved merit and excellence uh, scripts of, of real students' work. You can read the assessment report that the examiner writes. Uh, there's a whole range of things that, that students and teachers can see. It's not sort of password protected. Um, it's totally open. Anyone in the world can view that. And you can download and look at those assessment matrices. There's all, all sorts of things that you can do. Um, uh, it's uh, very open. Um, and this is where uh, one issue can arise because students can go, right, I'm going to have a look at that um, exemplar there. Let's look at my work here. Okay, I'll sort of copy little bits of that there. Um, that can have an impact, but with good assessment design, that's not going to happen because we as teachers and educators know that we shouldn't have exactly the same exam as we had the previous year. Okay, so um, student, that's all open to students, um, and that's one of the things that they might do to take a shortcut. It's also one thing they do when they get their work back, um, they can uh, say, hang on, but my work's far, far better than the exemplar that I found on the NZQA. 
um, and so I deserve a higher grade. And so that, that's another conversation that we can have. But uh, it's, um, uh, the openness, I think, is something that we, we really should be proud of in New Zealand. Um, this is an important point, given that um, NCEA isn't just for getting kids to university. Um, there's, uh, we talked a lot about achievement standards with the, the Achieve Merit Excellence. There's a whole range of other standards called unit standards, where there's, you get achieved or not achieved, or credit and no credit. Um, and many of those uh, are sort of uh, like a transition or foundation uh, sort of uh, qualifications to help students uh, who might not be, you know, high academic achievers yet to sort of their gateway into um, achievement standards with achieve merit and excellence. So there's a whole, there's particularly uh, unit standards around literacy and numeracy uh, where there's portfolios of evidence to be assembled rather than an exam or a, a rigid assessment um, for that. Um, and they, they can be very useful. They're probably less relevant actually for, um, for you teaching the tertiary level, but it's, uh, uh, it's just good to know that um, NCEA is not just for the, the top academic students. Um, you probably know that students can get excellence. They can, they can have uh, excellence within a particular achievement standard, as you've got an excellence grade. I got an E, which is uh, something that we're used to thinking is a good thing in high school, but isn't quite so good at, at tertiary level, maybe. Um, you, students can get their overall NCEA level one endorsed with excellence. The whole lot is valued at excellence. If they get 50 excellence credits overall, the whole certificate for that year is endorsed with excellence. They can also get excellence or merit uh, in a particular subject or a particular course. That's called course endorsement. So you could have um, excellence in mathematics. You could have merit endorsed English. Uh, you could have no endorsed, but you've got achievement in, in history, for example. Um, and so you can see that there's a lot of uh, work gone into um, uh, trying to uh, fix this perception that uh, NCEA is all about bare minimums and that excellence isn't rewarded and it's not challenging enough. Um, and I, I think that, that idea of NCEA not being challenging enough, uh, that, that should be fought against. That's a perception that is, is I think, becoming increasingly inaccurate. Um, and we'll talk more about that, I think, over the next couple of slides. Um, th this bit here, it, it's a really robust system. I've been involved with NZQA since 1996 when we, uh, they were trialling uh, standards-based assessment. Um, and I've had all sorts of roles within NZQA. I've never worked for them, but I've been a contractor for them for things like exam marking and that sort of thing. Um, and the quality assurance, I have to say, is excellent. Um, I'm comparing it with systems in, in... I wouldn't compare it with Russia. It's just so corrupt, it's ridiculous. But I'll compare it with England, where I've, I've taught also. Um, I've got more confidence in NCEA than I have in any system in, that's being used in Britain. I'm basing that only on three years teaching experience in Britain, so I know that's limited. But um, the, there are checks for internal assessment um, that, that really prove that those grades that teachers are giving hopefully are not inflated, that teachers aren't just willy-nilly giving out grades because there's a nice child in front of them and they deserve it because they're a good wee chap. Um, that um, teachers' marking is audited. Um, both internally, we have an internal process. Schools work together, um, different schools collaborate and, and swap and do sort of like shared marking and that sort of thing and can you validate my assessment? Um, and there's also ev every year a requirement to send away randomly selected samples of internal assessment to an anonymous moderator somewhere else in the country who will check the teacher's marking. Uh, and teachers and department heads are held to account on this that your moderation rate you know, should not fall below um, a particular agreement rate um, and it's, it's very high in most schools uh, would be achieving an 80 to 90 percent agreement rate where the moderator agrees with the teacher's marking so it's, it's, it's a very robust system and uh, through, through um, the external exams again very robust system with um, you know, uh, one marking panel uh, looking after one achievement standard, you know, sort of specialising in that rather than spreading themselves um, too thinly. Um, it's a system I've got enormous confidence in. Um, that doesn't mean it's perfect, because as we, we move on to, there are some ways the system can actually appear particularly weak. So any, any questions on that? Have you got anything? Yeah, just jump in. <coughs> okay, all right. So, um, so I'll spend a little bit of time because I think this is of, of, of greatest concern. What I see in the media, there was an article, uh, was, it, was it Bruce Munro? Wrote in the, in the ODT um, last Saturday. Last Saturday. Um, and I've read it many times before in North and South magazine, um, all over, that um, um, 
NCEA doesn't prepare students for university because when they turn up in your first year classes, they're barely literate, if at all. They still can't use a full stop after 13 years of schooling. <laughs> okay. um, to a large extent, I share that frustration with you because they're about, well, at high school they arrive into my class and I'm thinking, yeah, but you've been at school for eight years already. How could you not know how to use a full stop? Um, so I, you know, to some extent, I, I know what, what you're facing when you have um, a student transitioning from the small pond in my case was primary school into the, the bigger pond, which was high school. Um, but we'll talk about UE literacy in particular because university entrance is a qualification. Um, and to get UE, you need these four bullet points here. You need your NCA level three. Um, so you need your 80 credits. Oh, this is where the system's so complex. Strictly speaking, you need 60 level three credits plus 20 you can carry on from level two. So you need NCA level three. Out of those NCEA uh, subjects, uh, you need at least 14 credits in three separate approved subjects that the uh, universities have approved. Uh, NZQA has worked with, the, I think, the Vice Chancellor's Committee to come up with this list of approved subjects. So it can't be in any subject that a school has made up, uh, consisting of any random achievement standards uh, to you know, make a course that is, is relevant for the kids in front of them. Um, it has to be sort of approved sub. You, you, you can see the list of approved subjects. I think you can click on there and it, it'll show you. And you'll see that they are probably more traditionally academic subjects taught at tertiary level. Um, so you need 14 credits in those. Now, that'd be 40. Typically, the, these courses would have about 24 credits in them. So more than half the credits is, you can see how that might be thought of as like a passing mark, a passing grade. Um, so that, that's the second component. Third thing, um, this is, this is the, the interesting thing from my point of view, you need UE literacy. UE literacy. You need five credits in reading and five credits in writing at level two or above. So they, these credits um, are specified, there's a big long list of them, that specifies as to where you can get these literacy credits from. Um, and this is where we just need to be quite uh, clear about what we actually understand by literacy. Uh, we don't mean by literacy, I'm not sounding very literate, am I? We don't mean by literacy that the students can uh, perfect with their use of language. Um, we mean that they have probably got enough literacy to function, to learn at a tertiary level. Because this doesn't mean writes perfectly. Um, so th these credits come from a whole wide range of subjects, a whole wide range of achievement standards. So you can get UE literacy credits in phys ed or economics, or geography, or certain science achievement standards. Not every one of them, but in almost every subject there's the possibility for students to earn credits in UE reading, UE writing. Now here's sort of the interesting thing, because I, I know that one of the concerns at tertiary level is students' command of, of writing, command of English, their spelling and punctuation, all of that sort of thing. There are 198 UE literacy standards which assess writing. 198. I counted them and it was really boring. One of them assesses written accuracy, that idea of being able to write with control. And we looked at that earlier, that, that, that um, writing standard where, you know, with control. So that word there, control, is that's what, what we're looking for, this idea of written accuracy. So when we understand what NZQA's view here, and you know, NZQA working with the Vice Chancellor Committee, that, that um, there's only two out of, sorry, let's say one, I meant two out of the 198. There's the level two English writing portfolio and the level three English writing portfolio. They're the only ones which actually assess written accuracy. Because when you think about it, a student could do geography, for example, and they're being assessed on their skills as a geographer, uh, maybe in a written report. We like it to be accurate, and geography teachers will be working with the students to improve written accuracy. But that assessment in geography is assessing the student's ability as a geographer, not as a writer. And you see, um, that's one, one way which, you know, NCEA has got this perceived disadvantage that it's not geography plus being able to literately and, and fluently communicate that. It's the skills of the geographer. So likewise, um, if you're looking at, uh, say, earth and space science and looking at a geology, um, achievement standard in geology, they're being assessed on their understanding of geology not writing. So that, that's where, it's, it's, if, we, if, that, if that's um, something you can sort of keep in your head, it might help you understand where these kids have come from and how in, in your courses it might appear that, hang on, they're really sort of deficient in this area. Even though they've passed all these things, they could have excellence 
in geography and still be weak when it comes to writing a written report. Yeah. So in interesting that um, uh, numeracy, the, the requirements, are similar for um, uh, literacy, but numeracy is an easier bar to achieve. This is level one, sort of like school cert maths. It's, it's an easier bar than, uh, than uh, th this here. Um, one point that I do find interesting that um, in the level three standards, these approved subjects, if you look at all the approved subjects, um, English, chemistry, biology, all of that sort of thing, there are 553 achievement standards. Now, students aren't going to do all of them. Most students would, would probably be assessed against about 80 to 90 of them. But out of those 553, only one assesses written accuracy. And that's the, um, it's, that's its number. And that's at the English Level 3 Writing Portfolio. So it's quite interesting to, you know, to see what, what the demands of literacy are um, and that having UE literacy doesn't mean that, that you know, your students can write perfectly and flawlessly. So into any comments or any thoughts on that? It's quite surprising, isn't it, when you look at the numbers? Yes. Yes. So why isn't there a parallel of literacy? Why isn't there a requirement? Why didn't the Vice Chancellor require the unit standard in literacy that yep. would insist? Th there are. Th th this um, uh, this thing, thing here is just the university entrance qualification. To, for students to achieve NCEA level one, there's a numeracy requirement, same as this. There's also a literacy requirement for NCEA level one. But I, th I think um, if, if it was felt by you know your profession that you still wanted the you know, students' writing skills to be raised, then maybe the Vice Chancellor Committee needs to look at something like having this particular standard in every student's record of achievement as being that they must have this to be able to function at university. And that's um, uh, so a good comment, and I have, I have heard that comment before. Yeah, just to say that these unit standards, I'll talk about these a little bit more, but they're actually not a um, situation of um, feeling good about having those unit standards there, they're actually, the level of the unit standards is, the unit standards are designed for often people to transitioning into um, other tertiary institutions. It could be, they're not necessarily about um, numeracy in terms of proportional reasoning and getting them ready to really partake in the community. The level of numeracy, um, you know, when I look at the people that are applying to do our course, when I look at that they're numerate, but I look at what achievement standards or unit standards they've done, they don't have proportional reasoning or working with percentages or things like that. There's, there's a couple of achievement standard numbers I look for to know that that, that student is numerate. Because we assess our students and 60% of them in our assessment don't meet numeracy standards. So, so these are not, but these are not in any way robust. Because, as, as Ian said, I mean one of them is for example um, agriculture, there's an agriculture um, standard that allows them to get numeracy credits from that. And not only does the, um, the agricultural standard not assess for, um, for particular numeracy skill, the, the teacher's not necessarily um, from a numerate background or a mathematical background themselves, and they're not identifying that as a skill that needs to be grown with the, that group of students. So it is a real problem. Um, yeah, this is something that, for me, is... Hmm. <laughs> this is uh, and I know that Bridget Casey's been doing some great work on this, um, Yep. It is too a concern for high school teachers because I've had many teachers come to me and say, but I'm doing this thing for, for geography, how am I supposed to mark for literacy? Um, and that's been a concern of, of theirs as well. Um, and the NZQA's response to that is, no, no, you just assess it for geography. There's enough sort of embedded literacy which might feel a bit sort of nebulous and woolly in such a grey area for us if we're looking for precision. But um, you know, that has been a concern of, of teachers as well. I'm expected to teach punctuation now, but I teach PE. So. I just wanted to be clear. So is the communication model that students will always be communicating with someone who has a better understanding of language than they do? Is, uh, because, I mean, to assess someone's ideas, yep. if they're willy nilly. Yep. Yeah. yep, exactly. Well, the, the high school teachers have to assess against their own subject and whatever the achievement standard specifies. So it might be. Uh, um, apply algebraic method to solve complex equations. That's what's being assessed, not the, any level of literacy that might be there in a report. 
um, or if, it, if it's something like... Um, if it's secret, it's through mathematics. Standards. Mm. Nice, eh? Yeah. Um, I think well, I'll pick up on one thing that um, um, Naomi said earlier. I would if I could remember what it was. <laughs> I've just lost my train of thought. Never mind. Move on to the next one because it'll, it'll come back. But, so we'll look at... You've heard me you know, talk a lot about the strengths of NCEA. I do think it's a great system. I think its greatest strength is its flexibility. Its greatest weakness is its flexibility. Um, so here are a few things up here that I've, I've seen and I know happens across the whole country. Um, you know, sometimes in, in some particular schools, it, 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 there's not a good combination of subjects. Uh, it can be very hard to find physics teachers, for example. Um, it can be very hard to find uh, a chemistry teacher, for example. Um, and so just those sorts of practicalities um, in, in some schools, it, it may be uh, smaller areas, harder to staff. Um, you know, that, that could be uh, having an impact on the, the skill level of the students. Um, you know, many, many teachers are called upon to teach a subject in which they don't have much particular expertise. Um, I think probably the, the, the third bullet point there is, is probably, I think, um, worth explaining a little bit more. Teachers have got so much flexibility. They, they can choose anything. Um, my example here comes from level three English, like year 13 English. Uh, my class was doing Hamlet, uh, and we spent what, 12 weeks on that, and uh, the, the focus was uh, getting my students varsity ready. And my students had to hand in a 1500 word essay with a bibliography um, based on some aspect of Hamlet, you know, whether Hamlet was mad or whatever. Um, and a different school was getting kids to give a two minute presentation about the film Kung Fu Panda. And the kids came away with the same credits in the same achievement standard. So, and I can understand why that teacher, I, I don't know who it is by the way, it was just from the NZQA website, someone was doing Kung Fu Panda. Um, and I know why, because that teacher was maybe looking at his or her class and thinking, okay, what will work well with this? What will engage this class? And maybe there's, there's lots of, could be lots of great learning around animation, genre conventions, all sorts around that. But you can see why, you know, when the teacher's got so much uh, freedom, you know, maybe the Kung Fu Panda people aren't all going on to university. Maybe none of them is going on to university. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's the choices that we can have as teachers. And it's very easy to see how maybe a teacher could make a poor choice there in choosing something that isn't so challenging uh, for the students um, because it's convenient or it's uh, practical or, or whatever. So that, that's a probably, um, I think, probably a, a, a really big thing. There's so much choice there, nothing is specified. Um, I think that the next one, assessment driven, uh, I've, this is very, very common. Um, but thankfully it's becoming less common. And that is teachers and schools thinking that if I list my achievement standards in a particular sequence, there's my program of teaching and learning. First we will do 3.1, then we will do 3.5, then we will do 3.9. That's not, you're listing your assessments. That's not a program of teaching and learning. Um, and I know that a lot of uh, high school teacher professional development has been around this. Plan a program of teaching and learning that is engaging. Then choose which achievement standard you're going to use to assess that. And there is a change here. This is happening. Um, but I still, I, I, I totally understand why this is convenient for teachers because those NCEA grades, um, they're held accountable for it. They're published in the newspaper, you know, ranked and you know, NCEA pass rates. Um, and, you know, I, I'm sure, you know, as, as educators yourselves, w when you see things like league tables, you think, oh, but people don't understand all the, what's going on behind it. Um, and, you know, high school teachers have that pressure as well. So I, I can understand why that happens. I don't think it should happen. Um, and we are sort of making some, some movement on that. But uh, you, you still do hear teachers talk about we're doing 2.6 now. You're not. You're doing the skills around whatever, whatever, and you will use 2.6 to assess it. Um, very much in the same way that in your particular courses, you probably don't say we're doing essays now. <laughs> you know, you, you, you're doing some learning around this particular thing. It will be assessed by an essay maybe. Okay, so that's, that's probably worth a bit. Um, Connections between standards sometimes fragmented. Um, NCEA can be a bit, my favorite colloquialism in this is bitsy shitsy. There's a bit here and a bit there and a bit there and a bit there and a bit there. And, a bit there and, a bit. and students can, can choose all these things and teachers can choose what standards to do. Um, so it's, it's not altogether, even though there is coherence within the system, the student doesn't end up with a coherent qualification. 
and this is the point that's just come back to me because I just remembered it. It's perfectly possible for a student to study English and maths and have excellence endorsed English, but they haven't passed that writing portfolio standard so they can't write accurately. Hang on, how can you be excellence in English when you can't use full stops and apostrophes? It's perfectly possible for a student to have um, NCEA level three mathematics endorsed with excellence, but they've failed every algebra paper, every algebra assessment they've done. That is possible. And you think, but you can't be an excellent mathematician if you can't do algebra. So the, the system is very flexible like that, but um, un unless we, we take the time to drill down into what achievement standards has the student achieved? What grade did that student get? Let me look at your, your, your maths achievement standards. You haven't passed algebra in three years. That tells you more about the, the, the student's ability in maths than, oh, you've got maths endorsed with, with merit or excellence. The trouble is though, no one here and no one at home, no employer has got the time to look at every single student's record of achievement because it goes on for pages. You've seen how long those achievement standard titles are and there's a lot of abstract nouns in there um, and you need Dewey literacy to be able to read them. Um, so it, it's, it's too much to expect but in an ideal world we would examine their record of achievement to know what skills the student has got. In other words, what achievement standards have they passed? And so that's why, you know, on a sort of practical level, we sort of group things together, whether you need NCA level three, UE literacy, UE numeracy, three approved subjects for 14 credits or more. You know, that sort of makes it convenient, but it doesn't give us the full picture. Um, inconsistencies and variability. I think the Kung Fu Panda and Hamlet example is, is a good example of that. Um, and the, the students can come away with the same grade, excellence in English 3.8 or, or whatever. Um, th this bit here is, is probably highly relevant to um, teachers and educators in tertiary because at high school there's almost, it's almost an expectation from students and their parents in the best interest of the kids to really coach them through, well today we'll do this and there's the template, fill this out and then move on to the next, but today you'll write 200 words on this, you know really sort of um, hand holding all the way through the assessment process. Okay, there is some value in that because students can learn about that as, as they're going along. Um, and th there is no real value in saying, but I've done all the teaching and learning, now go and do your assessment. I know you're struggling, but good luck. Okay, we, we do provide more sort of coaching and feedback along the way. Uh, the idea is that at high school we provide in the early stages of uh, an internal assessment, lots of hands-on feedback. Yes, well good, here's some idea manipulates. Have you thought about this? But as the, the student's work is becoming almost complete, we should be doing hands off. Okay, now you need to go and sort of proofread your work and, uh, and make sure you've got, go through back to the achievement standards and the checklist. So we're backing off a bit rather than all, you know. That's the ideal, but sometimes in practice, you know, in your classroom, you've got 25 kids in there and this kid's coming up to you. Is it achieved yet? Is it achieved yet? I've added one more word. Is it achieved yet? No, look, we can't have this, come, and there's a bit of pressure on the teachers. And we've known this kid since he was 11, and you know, so, oh, bless, he's such a nice wee chap. You, know, you can see how it's so, it's so difficult when you're firstly um, almost in loco parentis, and then secondly, you're the coach of this team in front of you. But then you're also the referee. Oh, and it's, it's, it's that, I'm the coach, and I'm also the referee. Uh, and that can be tricky. I'm sure that that experience is, is not unique to, to high schools. I know that will be um, partly your experience as well. Um, but that idea of, of coaching through uh, um, in class to ensure authenticity, all of that sort of thing, teachers are, are, are there seeing the kids do this, this, this work every day, moving towards assessment, and it's easy uh, to slip into providing too much help with all the best intentions. You know, for, it, it's, it's good for the kids, but it does, you know, it can sort of compromise the validity of an assessment if teachers provide too much help. Um, which is very similar to th th this point here. There's lots of safety nets. Probably one of the, the things you know about NCEA is you can have multiple attempts at the same assessment. Um, and on one hand, that's okay because I've seen the Olympic high jumpers and they have three goes or four goes. Um, but in a, in, a, in a high school setting, it's what should actually happen is, is different from what actually does happen in many cases. Uh, now what should happen is this, for internal assessments a student has there, there's my submission, there's my work teacher, and the teacher looks at it and goes, you're really close to the achieved grade, um, but you need to think precisely about your use of units in this chemistry 
thing, hand it back. You've got about half an hour, look over your work and resubmit it in half an hour, having you know, paid attention to that little hint I've given you. And there's no more teaching from me, and then you resubmit it. And that seems a fairly honest thing, a little bit of advice, pay attention to units, pay attention to punctuation, then hand it back in half an hour. That's what a resubmission should be. And in many cases it's not. Um, not through any willingness by teachers to undermine the whole system, but it's just human being, I suppose. Um, the other thing is a further assessment opportunity where students can have a completely fresh go at this internal assessment, different task, a different piece of work is, is submitted. So really, students can really only have maximum three goes at any internal assessment. So they can have the, the, their first go, resubmit it. If they do that and they're still not there at the standard, they can take a further assessment opportunity. Now, this is where kids are very practical. They don't take the further assessment opportunity because I just want to fix it in five minutes and get it over with and move on to the next thing. Because it means starting again. They're very practical. So, oh, I'll just flag that. And this is where kids are so practical. I'll flag that because um, I've got all these other credits coming from, from other subjects. I don't really need it. I've got, my, I've got my 80 credits already. I've got my 50 credits at excellence. I don't need any more excellence credits because I've got overall endorsed with excellence. I'll just stop. And then teachers have these conversations like, yeah, you, you know what? See, when the All Blacks are leading by 19 points to 2, they don't stop. They don't say, oh, we're going off the field now. 19 points is enough. Thank you very much. But that's what, that's what kids do in, in classroom because they're, they're very pragmatic. They, th they think they're gaming the system. That was a point raised earlier. Um, they think they're sort of, oh, I've got my credits, I'm done, and I can relax. Um, and I think that's a, 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 a big risk. And so we, we do have kids all the way through thinking, oh, algebra, they're too hard, I won't do that. I'll focus on this, this one to do with statistics instead. Um, and making all those um, choices, which to them seems really practical, to us because we know better that they do end up with large gaps. I think the point was made over here, there's sometimes big gaps, they don't know how to do this, this, this a fairly rudimentary thing. Uh, it's partly due to um, choosing what standards they might like to do. It's partly due to whatever the, uh, uh, the way that the, the courses might have been designed by the teacher. Um, and the student being, uh, they, they sort of failed it the first time, they don't have another go at it the next time. That, that's probably partly it. Um, let's move on. We'll talk more about the students. I think we'll probably address that first point there about you know, certain gaps. Yeah. Um, some students stop at 80, I think we'll sort of address that. Um, the third point here is, this, this means a lot to me, because um, this is, as a high school teacher, this is enormously frustrating, and I can imagine um, uh, it can cause frustration at tertiary level too. Most external exams assess three achievement standards in three hours. NZQA is very clear on this, that an achievement standard external exam should be able to be completed in an hour. So you could do three in three hours. And that seems perfectly reasonable. And probably most of us in this room at some point have sat an exam where we've written four essays in three hours. Um, that's really common in, in, in my experience. And that's the way the old iteration of NCEI was. Do four things in three hours. Now it's three in three hours, which seems, you know, fairer. It's not a race. It's not a speed test. But still, in that three hours, a student can come into the exam room and go, there's my three standards. I'm not doing that one. Put it on the floor. Now I've got three hours to do these two. That's an hour and a half each. Some students think, I'm just going to do one. I'll just do the one. I'll spend three hours on this and write a 15-page essay that's really long and really boring, frankly. Okay? Because they've got three hours. And, and, that's, and so they, they make that decision not to do a third or two-thirds of the exam. Now, clearly, that's not going to translate well if they do that at tertiary level, is it? So, um, but students may come to you with that sort of expectation. I'm not doing that bit of the course. I've decided to you know, look elsewhere. Um, and that can result in, in um, significant gaps in students' knowledge and skills and ability and, and, and achievement. Um, I always like, an, I, I like using sporting analogies because I've taught boys for, what, 14 years or so. Sporting analogies work really well. Um, and I like saying, but it's like, it's like I'm not going to do the swim length of the triathlon. I'll just get on the bike straight away. And oh, look, I won. Look at that, because you didn't do the two-kilometre swim. Um, and it's a... Uh, Students understand that, yes, I know, I know. And they don't tell their teachers, I've got no intention of doing that particular achievement standard, I'll just focus on these two. Uh, they don't tell their parents that either, and they, um, 
uh, until they get their results and it's a standard not attempted and then teachers go grr because we wanted students to attempt every standard and, and have a go at everything. Um, some of these are probably not exclusive to, to NCEA. Um, sometimes, you know, being a teacher is a bit of a popularity contest. Um, students do use all safety nets. Oh, it's all right. I know it's not good enough, they say, as they hand in their work. But it's all right, I'll resub it. Okay. But you do know it's the teacher's decision whether or not a resubmission is offered to you. Oh, I didn't know that. You need to know that. Um, so go finish it off. Um, um, I had one student one year uh, said, uh, we're doing oral presentations um, and his name was Sam and he, he, he said, I'm not ready, I'm really not ready, but no, it's all right, I know we do names out of a hat, literally it was a hat, um, and uh, he said, so I've got a 1 in 25 chance of my name being pulled out, I'll be all right, I'll do it tomorrow. Um, and so someone randomly selected and it was him and he, he stood up and he did not achieve. Um, but he was just hoping. So um, th this can be interesting that Students don't see too far ahead into the future. And when you're 15, on one hand, that's not a bad thing. Um, on the other hand, by the time you, you're in years 12 and 13, they need to have some understanding of where they're heading. So all of those uh, uh, extra credits that you, you might have thought were great and they've contributed to your 80 credits, there are plenty of gaps because the student might have stopped at 80 credits because they got 10 credits for a barista course they did in the holidays. That's really good. That can contribute to NCEA. They've got their driving license. Yay, so that can contribute to NCEA. So some of the students that come into your courses might have, they've got the 80 credits, they've got all this, they've got all of that, but they're in things that are not actually relevant to your courses, so there could be some gaps. Um, I know of one student um, in Dunedin who has got a lot of credits through swimming and coaching. And those credits, because of the whole nationwide qualifications framework for a whole range of skills, everything, you know, being a cashier, uh, being a cleaner, all of that, so being a swim coach, uh, this student has got credits in uh, swimming. And that's contributing to her NCEA, level three. And she is at risk of thinking, well, fine, I've got my 80 credits. I don't need to do that. I don't need to do that. I've got my, my sport and, and these other things that, that, that are keeping me busy. So. You can see that when they get credits from other places, they're very practical, um, pragmatic um, kids, they sometimes stop. Um, this, is, this is definitely, definitely true. Um, my guess will be it's reasonably similar at some parts of tertiary level, that if, unless this is, is count, this is going to be in the final exam. Um, are there credits attached to this? If there are, I'm interested. No, no, we're learning because learning is fun. Okay, I'll just plug into my matrix and, and have a look at my phone. Um, that can be really common. Um, I know that many schools at the moment, the debate nationwide is, is NCEA over assessing kids? Uh, and you know that the Minister of Education has, has a working party together to, to look at that and is there too much assessment in NCEA? Um, I'm going to be very bold here and say no there isn't. I do not think that six assessments, three external, three internal, per subject is too much. In a year. I don't think that's too much. Um, when we look at uh, high school kids doing sport, we're quite happy with them doing pre-season training in rugby now. And they will play rugby maybe once a week for about 20 weeks. They're being assessed 20 times on the same skill, week after week after week. Very few people who are interested in rugby think that that is excessive. Um, and I, I wonder too, if, if we're saying that uh, there is sort of talk that let's abolish NCEA level one. That's one proposal, no decision made yet. Because let's just get kids involved in making learning interesting and fun and engaging them. But we know, because if you're 15, you're credit focused, and no, this is my last year to have fun because NCA level two next year, um, I'm gonna have fun now. Um, I don't particularly want the credits. And I do wonder in, the, in that debate, I, I, I personally, this is personal opinion, I'm not a, a voice, mouthpiece for NCEA, NCQA or anything, but um, let's retain NCEA level one. In a sort of a parallel proposal, at tertiary level, why do you assess at 100 level? Why not just focus on getting your students engaged and switched on and making learning fun and interesting and assess them from 200 level? Because there's excessive assessment at 100 level. Now that's absurd, isn't it? And likewise, let's take the analogy to sport. Uh, well, let's, uh, uh, in year 11, with 15 year olds and 16 year olds, let's not have competitive sport on Saturdays. They can turn up to coaching sessions and practice and they can learn skills, but they don't need to compete because there's too much pressure on them to compete. 
And I'd rather, I, I would much rather, uh, the point was raised, I think it was over here about anxiety. Um, I would much rather that uh, parents and teachers uh, help kids cope with those pressures rather than avoid them. Because I'm sure we all know that if you, if you have um, a fear of something, an anxiety towards something, avoidance doesn't help you conquer it. Um, and that's where a lot of energy, that's where schools, I think, should be putting a, a bit more energy. I have to say that in, in the past 10 years, I've seen a, a massive increase in the levels of anxiety uh, that students feel. And it is hard work taking that anxiety away. Now, some students cope with the anxiety in very maladaptive ways by, oh, I'm so stressed, I won't do that algebra test. I'm so busy with my sport, I, I won't do that geography assignment because I've got plenty of opportunities for credits elsewhere. You know, and so maybe as, as parents, as, as teachers in high school, they're the conversations we need to have, how to manage with things. Because in, in real life, you do have deadlines and you do have responsibilities and you do have obligations. Um, and as adults, we need to learn to cope with them. And I don't think it's asking too much of a 15-year-old to cope with six assessments in a year. Um, I know there are a few um, high school teachers here. We, we might also remember uh, sixth form certificate. Uh, way back in the 80s and 90s, uh, most subjects in year 12 in the sixth form certificate had 10 assessments per year. So to have six in a year seems like a, a significant reduction. Mm. Any comments on, on any of this, by the way? Any questions? Could I test uh, an apprehension that I sometimes hear around the university that hasn't come up yet, I think? Yep. And that is that at high school, students are conditioned to go off to Google, then to Wikipedia, then copy and paste what they find, put it in their assessment, get to university, and not realise that's plagiarism. Mm -hmm. is, is, there any, is there any truth to that caricature? Um, there is some truth to that caricature. Uh, and NZQA are very clear with schools. There's a document for every single subject called Conditions of Assessment. And in there, there's always a statement that says, schools must ensure authenticity. And schools are required to teach how not to plagiarise, to uh, discuss and explore academic honesty, uh, many schools teach even you know, referencing and, and, and that sort of thing. Of, um, um, it's, it's tricky for kids um, because you know, they're 16 and 17. It's really convenient to copy from Wikipedia. An enormous number of schools are already using plagiarism uh, software checking like turnitin.com. Uh, there are plenty of other tools as well. Um, they're also encouraging their senior students uh, uh, to use things like Harvard Generator for generating bibliographies and things. There's some really good learning. Some students are still, haven't, haven't quite got there yet. They're looking for the shortcuts. And so you can see things like uh, whole paragraphs in a different font and color. Um, <laughs> so, you know, but um, I, I, I think, I'd probably say most secondary schools in Dunedin use Turnitin. There is a cost to that for schools. It was quite expensive. Um, and that's a way of, of firstly you know, teaching students that, hey, look, um, this is what we do. Um, and there are consequences. Uh, if a student is caught uh, plagiarising, um, they are not allowed the credits for that standard. If they're caught a second time, they will be withdrawn from the entire subject. So if you cheat twice in maths, you're withdrawn from maths completely. Um, there are consequences for that. Um, but with good teaching and learning and effective coaching, Hopefully, you're seeing your kids work on their assessment every day. Hey, you see you're on Wikipedia. Uh, and any teacher can Google five or six words from a phrase and actually find the Wikipedia article if you, know, if, if you choose the right words. Um, so yes, it, it's a perception. Yes, it, it's a problem. And I think we're moving in the right direction, but it's not perfect yet. Any, any other comments or, or, or questions? Um, I think we'll spend a, just a little bit on, on this, about what, what's it like um, when a kid is at school in their small pond. Um, so this is sort of, NCEA is, is part of it. You know, it's probably part of it here. We haven't got assessment there, Naomi, look at that. <laughs> yeah. But when you, when you think of all these things that, that's going on at school, uh, some schools have five or six sports interchanges per year. But all the kids in the sports team get you know, a day off school to go and play sports. There's lots of value in that. But they miss out maybe on the learning. And the rest of the class has to carry on. Um, some work at uh, supermarkets, or they might deliver papers in the morning. 
know, they've got a part-time job maybe. They might have evening commitments such as music practice or a sport. Um, the school formal, oh my goodness. When April comes around, from April until June, um, that's all the, the really thinking about what they're going to wear, the boys as well, not, not just the girls in the gowns. The school production is an enormous distract because it's six months of rehearsal. And then the, the performance and then the, 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 the low that kids experience after that is all over. The sense of disappointment. Where will I find meaning in my life again? Really? From algebra? You think so? So, you know, there's, um, you can see, you see what, what, what was it like? We were all teenagers once, weren't we? Um, they might be on the school council. They might be on the school newspaper. They might be a house captain and they might get to wear a badge. You look around, the, next time you're around the octagon downtown or maybe look at your, your, your own children if, if they're at senior high school, some blazers look like xylophones, don't they? <laughs> with, with all the badges, all the things they're involved with. All the, they might have blues in this and rep awards and that. There's all sorts of things. They want their driving license. Um, some boys I taught also want their firearms license. Um, um, I probably better expand on that, hadn't I? Um, they want their vote <laughs> because uh, with, with McLashen, there's uh, about 150 boarding boys, and so it's very practical if you're coming from a farm to have your firearms license. Okay, I didn't mean anything sinister by that. <laughs> um, turning 18 and all the fun things that happen when you're 18, such as voting and going to the pub, not necessarily in that order. Um, you know, part-time work can uh, suck an enormous amount of time away from students. Um, I'm sure your students are no exception to this. Um, it, it's really tricky because somehow they must make ends meet um, and you know they've also got to finance their car and their driving license and finance their thing for the formal and get the right course size and all that. Oh yeah, 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 relationships. Yeah, we did, didn't we? We did. So they're, they're very busy these kids and it's great because if they're idle they get up to mischief. Um, but if you think of these um, uh, the relationships that they're involved in at secondary school it looks a little bit different at tertiary. Not much different, but a, a, a little bit different. Probably th th this bit here, the, probably these top two um, are, are reasonably, reasonably important for you to think about. Uh, they see their teachers every day. They see their form teacher every single day, five days a week. They see their subject teacher four or five days a week. Sometimes they've got the same teacher for two different subjects. And so they can really feel sort of part of a team. Um, and that can feel very nice. Uh, sometimes have the same teacher for two or three or four, or heaven forbid, five years in a row. So that can feel quite, oh, that's quite nice that we know each other. It's safe. Um, and when you transition to tertiary, uh, maybe there's only, the lecture is twice a week, not every single day. So it's harder to you know, forge that relationship with the person who's teaching you. Um, this second point here is, you know, the, the form teacher is a bit like your, the, the, it's a bit like the kid's a lawyer. Okay, I'll look out for you. I'll go into bat for you. I'm not going to jail for you, but I'll go into bat for you. Um, and I'll look after your welfare. I'll talk to your parents. I'll talk to the guidance counsellor. I'll talk to the, the deputy principal or the assistant principal. We'll get some help. We'll, we'll, we'll connect with counsellors outside the school to help you with your anxiety. Um, we'll invite your parents in and we'll have a talk like that. Um, these things could happen at tertiary, but clearly not on the same scale as, as happens at high school, because at high school they're just kids. Um, and so all of these people, I think the key word there is actively. They're actively looking for kids at risk. And you, if you've been watching the news, anything that phrase, at risk, students at risk of not achieving, at risk of anxiety or depression or whatever, self-harm, whatever. Um, there's a whole range of people actively looking out for that um, with kids. Mum and dad are fantastic support. Um, my guess is at high school, uh, mum and dad are a bit more actively involved than they are at tertiary level. Thankfully, um, I know that a high school teacher's experience is quite commonly, this has happened to me many a time, uh, where the, the, for, with all the best reasons in the world, uh, the parent will turn up and question my assessment decision and say, I think this work is actually at excellence level. Okay, I think it's not. <laughs> um, and at, at one point, my sort of most acute example of this was the end of a lesson. The, the students had been assessed, given an oral presentation, and there's your grade. Okay. Oh, look, there's the bell. Right, bye, see you later. Quite literally, less than a minute later, my phone is buzzing in my pocket. It's a mum wondering why her son only got merit, not excellence. And that's, that's a frustration. That, and so you, you can imagine, you know, okay, we're all human, mostly. And when, as a teacher, you're making those assessment decisions, you know, oh, the difficult parent might ring. 
So it's easy to see the sort of context in which teachers might, you know, make a decision that isn't the best. Hopefully that doesn't happen, but it must. It's, it must at some point. Yeah. Um, there's relationships in sports teams and captain of your sports team. They're all, all busy things, and they've got coaches there. Um, uh, the, the idea of, of leaders within a school, prefects and head boy, head girl, whatever, head prefect, they're really important. Um, and kids really aspire to that. Uh, what I've seen, and th this came, uh, was brought home to me by a former student who's now, uh, I think, final year of law, or, or close to, at, at Otago. He said, do you know one thing I've noticed? All of the people I know at university who were head boy, head girl, they don't do so well. Maybe at high school, we somehow give too many accolades, too much praise, because we want to be encouraging and nurturing. We want this, you know, nurturing relationships. Maybe we give maybe too much recognition through um, all of these things, through all of that. Um, when students get here, they're used to all of those accolades. I don't see anyone at Otago University walking around with xylophones um, <laughs> on, their, on their lapels. Um, and there's a good reason for that. But it was interesting that that, that student noticed it. He wasn't, um, uh, he wasn't head prefect of, of, of McGlashan, but he's done very, very well at university, thriving, where you know, some others don't. There isn't the sort of nurturing relationship that, that boosts you know, ego and, and all of that sort of thing. Yeah. I think some kids who do very well at school, and I might be scrolling out 500,000, they forget that there's lots and lots, lots of other schools that have yep. kids of 500,000. Yes. And, and, and then the university, they, they all of a sudden they, they enter a new, new pond. Yep. And they, they experience these just mm. bright kids or brighter kids or whatever. Yep. And, and they don't quite know how to, how to cope sometimes. Yep. Yep, that's right. That's quite right. You, on, on, the f on their floor at the Hall of Residence, there might be six or seven other head prefects. There'll be some students who, who come to university, um, um, I know one of them because I'm used to referring to this person by using the first person pronoun, um, the highest achieving person at their school, and then they come to university and at Unicol, what, everyone here is a duck? So can't be sure. But that, that's the case for many. And it's, ah, uh, it's, oh, I'm not special. Um, and I think that that's a good lesson that, that parents and teachers, in addition to all this affirmation, we, we need to be doing that with, with young people. Um, I know that I've shown uh, my classes uh, over uh, several years. I forget the guy's name, but it's a high school teacher in the United States addressing like the graduating class of, of 2012. And he says things, you're not, do you remember what it is, Sarah? Yeah, no. Can't remember his name. Uh, no, but he, yeah, he's got dreadlocks. Yep. That one. Yep, I'm thinking of something different. But he, he says to the, um, uh, he says to the class, you're not special. Even if you are one in a million, that means there's about 8,000 people on this planet identical to you. <laughs> yeah. I think you're thinking of Tim Minchin. Yes. Yeah. And there's another thing worth looking up. Tim Minchin's address to the graduating class of Western Australia University, U University of Western Australia. That, that's also um, um, a fantastic uh, graduation speech. Um, have I missed anything out there, Naomi? You're fine. Just um, the, the emphasis that the students at, the students at university have these all these nurturing relationships, the students going into the university prior to that have these nurturing relationships around them and that's the real difference between, um, and there's lots of tiers of different nurturing relationships. Mm. Mm. I think that this is, um, this is a key thing, I'm sure this will happen at university. Um, maybe the, the difference is at high school kids are being told every day, look after your friends. Um, care for your friends. If you see someone who's, you know, who's, who looks as if they're struggling, help them get help. Um, and all of those organisations uh, like Youthline uh, and plenty of others to help kids deal with um, anxiety and mental health issues, that sort of thing. There's um, pamphlets being passed out in class and, and all of that's part of the ongoing discussion as maybe a form teacher or in the, the health and phys ed classes, that sort of thing. Um, I know that happens to some degree at, at university. Um, I don't know how, how visible it would be though, um, but you know, there you go. Right, let's move on. How are we going for time? 11.19, right. So Naomi um, is probably going to move in now and talk about transition pedagogy. Yeah. And um, should we swap microphones? We could. But I'll give you that because we need to see yeah. with all your wee stories. Okay. As usual, I've come without a pocket. So kia ora koutou everyone. 
Um, so I, just to give you a bit of background about me, I grew up in Northland in the beautiful um, Taitokoro area of our country and I was one of five people in my school who did um, sort of the year 13 or 7th form bursary as it was. There was 18 in my 7th form and only five of us were actually sitting the exams at all. I went to Waikato University um, and my first lecturer was Hamish Spencer who then came down to here and um, he was taught me for Algebra 1.1, Algebra 1.2 and so on and he was he was my favourite lecturer and it was so, so nice to see him around here. So I completely got lost. Um, and I realised that my mathematical background was not sufficient to really cope. I was the leader of my school. I was the house captain. I didn't have badges. That wasn't cool in Northland. <laughs> I had kudos. <laughs> um, I really did. I was the girl that everyone went to for maths help in my school and um, sometimes the teacher too. And, uh, and uh, I got to university and it was a very, very different scenario. And I was lost for about... Well, I had a really good time, but I was lost for about 18 months and it took me another year to catch up. And yes, I got a few good marks by the end of it, but it was quite good. So I, I went there and then I became an industrial statistician um, in a smelter in Invercargill and had a marvellous time there and then discovered teaching. So I've taught um, for a number of years up north and then moved to Kaikoura Valley College uh, where I taught with Gary and where's he gone? Oh, there he is. And uh, for a number of years but doing mathematics. Um, and then from there I did a PhD. I just wanted to stop and think for a bit. Um, stopping to think for a bit is really lovely. Um, and I followed a group of, I had the m enormous privilege to follow a group of 30 students for um, two and a half years. So I went to all their mathematics classes, I went to their English classes, I interviewed their teachers, interviewed their parents, interviewed them on a number of occasions, got to know them very, very well. And actually since then I've been following them more anecdotally all the way through to through the end of the university. So, um, but the longitudinal study I did uh, was my PhD and it set me up beautifully for uh, looking at affect or feelings around uh, learning about mathematics. So that's my, my research background. I then um, married a geologist who was more like Indiana Jones and took me off to Muscat and Sohar in the Middle East. So I lived there for four years um, and um, then taught in an international school. So that was very interesting. Um, the class was an interesting place. The boys were there, the girls were there. Swimming sports were non-existent for the girls. Um, it was very, very interesting with a few um, expat types, including my own children thrown in. Um, and then I came back here and thought, right, what do I do now? And um, I just knew what it was. I love teaching and I have been at the College of Education for five years. Um, so I am an um, emerging researcher, if you like, and a fairly new academic. And um, so interesting, so I'm not an expert at all in transition pedagogy and I have done some reading around this for this but I mean if you want the research, Stephen Scott's got some wonderful um, connections there and he's done some really good work himself. But one of the things was is I'd been a number of years a mathematics teacher in a classroom and then came here and thought that my teaching had to be really different. It doesn't work when you go, uh, Gary, I can see you. You're writing on the board. Gary, I can see you. Look, mate, no, none of that. Who threw that? <laughs> it doesn't work. I mean, but what I realised was I didn't need to throw out all of my practices. I didn't need to, the, the, the understandings I had about teaching and learning, 95% of them are the same, whether you're teaching school students and university students. And put it this way, there's only two and a half months difference between the year 13 kids that I taught, g'day, to the, to the first year students. So it was, it was quite, um, and of course I'd been away for four years, but a lot of people had gone off and then come back and here they were. My, in my first year here, I had two of my year 13 students in my first class and it was like, oh, here we go. <laughs> so. Really, um, Jacques Vandermeer has done some work on how, how the that, that academic transition, because that's really what we're talking about. But it's not just academic transition, it's um, the social transition. and the, It's really, we have to take a more holistic view of it. Holistic, I'll use the word organic in a minute and have to run out screaming. Okay, so it's often, there's really differences. Students really 
that lack of understanding of what is expected of them is, is really tricky. This is some work that was done by Victoria University. Victoria has done some lovely work on it. Um, they're actually in the middle of a longitudinal um, study that's followed some students through with that transition. They have published one piece, um, and I can give you the, um, the email of the person doing it. And, Michael, he, he's, um, he said, oh, he can't give it to you. It's just at that cusp. And of course, I'm at the wrong university for him to be sharing too much. But some of the earlier work they did, this is from 2014. Um, somebody, it's what, what Ian said about somebody chasing you up. That, that, uh, as a, so now I'm at the College of Education. I do 40% research and 40% teaching. And I do, if someone has not handed an assessment, often as a course coordinator, I may chase that person up, um, give them a phone call, hey, what's the story? Um, but probably only once, probably by email. Um, but there's, so there's less of that. And actually someone said, look, Naomi, you need to stop doing that. You don't have really the time for that. Um, I've got 120 in my class. I know some law classes have 600. Um, so basically, they're actively seeking help. You need the students, because you are one and they are many, you need the students to actively come to you to seek for help. Um, generally at uni, the, formal, the writing is formal and academic, and that whole assignment done in non-class time. One of the things around NCA, now you see I have another, I, am an, I have taught NCA for a number of years, but mostly since we did this talk last October at the Teaching and Learning Symposium, since then I am a graduate. I am a graduate as a parent because I have had my child finish NCA level one for the first time. So I have a new perspective of it. And one of the things that she has found, who, who did very well, got 140 credits, not 80, um, and w had a mother who said, I'd actually like you to do all three of the external assessment in the um, exam because that's really important so you know how you're doing with it. Um, she did very, very well in it, but um, what she found was is, yes, there are only six assessments, but they do a number of assessment practices in class beforehand. So it actually was quite assessment heavy. You might have a rebuttal to that, but for, for what she found, it was very early on in the learning when she was getting excited about, she loves history, getting excited about the history, it was now, hey, in the assessment, here's, let's practice this little bit, then hand it in. So it was assessment, um, it had been broken up into smaller assessments before the bigger assessment, then the practicing of the bigger assessment. Um, but she had a good year, um, and she doesn't feel like she had a good year because she didn't get excellence endorsed in every subject. There were tears, and I was not allowed to take her to dinner. So it, it's, it's about managing that stress and that anxiety. I was really proud of her. Um, I showed her her father's um, report card at the same age, and that helped somewhat. <laughs> <laughs> He was not invited back to Pateru High School, put it that way. <laughs> um, so another thing was is that the final um, grade is made up of number of assessments adding up to 100%. I've already found since starting here that quite a lot of times the students are not handing in work. Um, so we, we do that through, we try and work that through our course, um, our course requirements, our course outlines to say that they need to have um, submitted, completed, it's quite an interesting um, word that we were having a discussion about this yesterday, um, all components of the assignment or they have to have passed all components, those two are quite different things. Um, and reading being a core expectation, reading is limited at school, this is of course what the Victoria person, the Victoria team found, um, and that would probably be a fair point, that the amount of out-of-class reading they have to do is fairly limited. I, yeah, I, go, I, go, go. I think that's an absolutely true point. Um, and uh, I know from my own teaching experience, say teaching, I have to use an English example, that's really probably the, the best I can draw from. Typically at uh, level two and level three, students would study one major text per year. So the novel in year 12, mm. the novel in year 13, or the Shakespeare play. Now compared with the tertiary level, that seems really light because you might in any one semester cover you know, a dozen texts. Um, I had uh, one student uh, who did NCEA with me uh, came back as a first-year student and he said, it's amazing, they expect you to read everything. <laughs> um, which I thought was, was quite a, a nice anecdote. Um, probably I've had more, more success with, with students who, because um, as, as, I've got the choice as teacher, I don't need to do one text. I could do two or three. Um, and if, if we can encourage teachers at high school to, to you know, 
maybe don't limit the reading. Give kids more mileage and experience there. Mm -hmm. That sets them up better um, for university. So you know, d doing this for an academic class at high school, I think, is essential. Yeah, one of the main, um, when we're talking at staff meetings at the college, one of the main critiques we have of our students is they're not doing the readings. So, and we, we work on what constructive ways to try and say, well, um, now this reading here, we come up with ranges of questions and clever ideas to m ensure that they're accountable for doing the readings, but it is very difficult, partly perhaps because of that difference. So, I mean, you know, first year schools do have that. They're, they're, they're men and high school because of their sports teams and things like that they're members of a flock or parts of a school of fish if you like from our pond analogy but as I found there were more big fish I was the maths girl back in school and then suddenly I wasn't the maths girl um, in, in um, university and those b more big fish and that's a really startling transition um, this hacking the system we've talked about that before really it is I don't know if you hear about cheats or things like that, the, 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 the gaming world now, they talk about cheats. And so sometimes you hear that talk, uh, cheats are like the hacks, the, the wee tricks to doing very well in a game. And it's, it's exactly the same in NCA. And that's exactly right. Um, so my daughter was told by her mother that she had to do all three externals in her three hour external exam because that's my expectation for her. And she agreed with me, her friend, was encouraged by her teacher to only do one of the three and encouraged by her parents and I mean and other people choose not to go to the exams at all because they've already got enough credits. So these are all these are all the different ways of dealing with it. Um, and here the, the system, well they've probably got their own ideas for hacking systems but they're not so quite so institutionalised. Um, I think the relationships, the nature of the relationships between students and teachers are very different at university compared to school and we'll talk about that. Uh, the literacy and numeracy, uh, you've already, I've clearly shown my feelings about that. Um, it is true. At the College of Education, we do assess them on their numeracy and 60% don't meet the expectation. Um, and yes, yet they've got their literate, numerate according to the university entrance requirements. Um, and I think that is a piece of work that we need to do fast and now and with the associated um, work around their feelings about numeracy and um, affect is really important. The lack of resourcefulness um, is, is true um, in terms of um, letting it happen to them rather than going out and seeking help. And also they've got this idea that university they are alone. So that's the, that's the, that's the different expectation. So it's about us building bridges. It's about not about how do we fix them. It's about what we can do in our own practice to build those bridges to, to, to help them to make that transition. It's about us putting those building bricks in rather than asking the kids to do it because they are still kids at that age. Okay, moving on then. Um, one, of the, one of the things is uh, for a student to meet learning outcomes, it does depend on their engagement. But what institution-wide we can do in staff, it's about generating conditions that stimulate that engagement as well. Um, and you know, so too often I hear, well, you can lead a horse to water, but <laughs> you can't make them drink. But it's about what, how do we make that water more palatable for them to drink? We're talking about ponds again. <laughs> so one of the first things, so Ian and I spent a bit of time reading about this, but first of all, we did, um, we kind of decided what we thought would be good. And we're not teaching you like how to suck eggs or anything. I mean, remember, I'm the most junior lecturer here. So, um, but I, this is what we came up with from a more of a having a school background perspective. And there's four sort of a structure of four things. The first one is provide quality teaching. So looking at your own teaching and how that, how that is, um, makes it more engaging for the students. And this is not just about making it fun. So it's focusing on, and we've talked about already some really good ideas about curriculum design, assessment, um, the structure of the papers, the pedagogies and teaching practices that engage students in learning. It's really difficult if you're in a lecture situation and you've got 600 students in front of you. I still think you can do cooperative learning. I still think you can do group work. I still think that you can have active learning in that lecture theatre. 
Um, it is all possible. Oh, my largest one is about 100, 120, and we are walking all around the room. We've got things happening. We've got resources out there. Um, it's a lecture theatre very like this one, but with no Wi-Fi, which might be one of the reasons it's so engaging. <laughs> so um, it's all about, so that active learning is really important. So active learning is a little bit different from today where you're not absorbing sponges things. We are the ones who know it all. Our court is going on actually. And it's, you. I mean, we could probably come up with a better list of things just from your own knowledge about this up here and go away and be really happy. And it's very like that for whatever you're teaching. I'd be ha having trouble if I went for my ancient Greek um, first year paper. But the students amongst you have so much knowledge about the subject anyway, construct uh, others' understanding by listening to, to what, what else is going on in the classroom and who knows and what the other students know in the classroom. So it's, it's about using that co collaborative learning, teaching and assessment approaches, but also teaching about including meta-learning, so how to be a social scientist. How to be a, so one of the first things I do when I'm teaching year 13s or year 12s is how to be a mathematician. And a mathematician, to be a mathematician, one, it's about identity. I am a mathematician and you, all my students are mathematicians and what does it mean and what skills does a mathematician do and how do we think and so it's about how to be a social scientist or how to be a scientist or how to be um, a Russian expert. <laughs> so, um, and how to learn in this discipline, how to work in a group. So there's, there's specific things, but general things as well. Um, really being explicit about the relevance of learning. Um, and that is, seems obvious, but over and over I'm seeing evidence where students, oh, it's a pain, I've got to do this course and it's a service course, so you know I've got 400 people doing it, and they're not really interested in it, but they have to do it because it's a prerequisite for their degree. So find out about these students, find out about why they're doing that service course, find out and include examples in your course about, um, about the discipline that they're doing. So if you've got a, you're doing a mathematics course and you know you've got a whole lot of geologists out there, ensure that in your teaching you're using geology examples even if it's a service course and they may never do mathematics again. Um, it, it's so important to in, just be very relevant in your teaching. Learning is social, learning is emotional. That's what I discovered with, with my PhD, learning is emotional, but it's also social. So knowledge is constructed through interactions with each other. And that's why the collaborative work and the cooperative learning and the small group work you're doing in science up there is really, really important. And that's got to be embraced. So you don't learn by absorbing without active active engagement with each other. You learn by um, talking to each other and interacting and building on each other's work. That's really, really important. So you've got to work with our physical surroundings, as I said before, and arrange that lecture theatre. Don't see it as a tiered um, thing where there's one person down the front. So in my lectures, I have students up there at the board there. I've got a group here. I've got another student. So I very rarely write on the board. They're doing all the writing on the board. Um, so it's, it's far more um, active and you can make the physical world work for you. It, it can be difficult. Um, and use course evaluations to identify areas of improvement. I do the formal course teaching evaluations all the time, but I'm constantly saying, hey, what do we think of this and what do we think of that, and just in the course. Um, just, just about little things, and not anything about my teaching or anything, but more about how does that group work work for you? Would you prefer to do it this way? What do you think? So that's really important. The second, t second one is about that e explicitness. So explicit about the role of the lectures and if you've got tutors as well. Um, I didn't really understand about, when I started university, about the difference between lectures and tutorials and sort of that relationship, how that relationship would work with a lecturer versus a tutor, tutor group leader. Um, I, I had no understanding about that. So as Stephen said, you've got to be really explicit about what's the lecturer's role and what can you expect from the lecturer. Um, those, and that other really good point that was made about that first semester assignment, providing exemplars. And, you know, a lot of people would think that it was just too coachy and too scaffolded. But for the first semester, we need to acknowledge that they have just come from this environment, most of our students. Um, so how to study for a mathematics exam is very specific. How to study for another exam would... Be, so all of those things are very specific to your fields, so you need to not assume that they know how to do that because they've done something at school. Um, and 
so providing examples of different levels of achievement and success criteria is something that's very much what we teach at college about how to plan a lesson. But it's really important saying, well, it's success or failure or, or A, B, C, D. What am I looking for? What specific evidence of success am I looking here? What does success look like? What does success sound like? Um, so, so, so really being specific about what you're looking for as a lecturer when it comes to the assessment. Uh, and anything else I want to say there? No, all of that is fairly self-explanatory apart from that. Number three is probably the thing I'm most passionate about, and it's about building that relationships with the students. So you were talking about building, uh, uh, looking at existing relationships with students, but it's also about your own relationship with the students. So I teach 120 people. By the end of the second week, I teach them for two hours. By the end of the second week, I know everybody's names. Okay, so that's the really important thing. And I do that not just by my amazing interactions I have with them, it's because I've got their photos and I'm practicing them. So I'm actually doing a little bit of homework about that. I know everybody's names. And so when someone's got a question, I say, oh, well, what do you think of that? Or yes, Mary, what, you had a different idea. And so that really is a major way. And at, at college, when I'm going to observe a student teacher in the classroom, the first thing I'm looking at, are they using students' names? And that's really hard when you've got 600, but it's a bit like the, the, the starfish on the beach. You might not know the 600 names, but you know David's name, and you know that David said something last time. You said, oh, David, I'm going to connect with you, because when someone talks in your class, you might ask them their name, and you go away and maybe learn five names a day and use them. So it's, it's, it's learning about then their backgrounds, their needs, their experiences. I've, I'm teaching a master's student this year who's doing the Masters of Teaching and Learning, and I was feeling cross with myself because after three weeks I realised he'd been a chef for 20 years. Now, um, I was assuming he'd just come from, I thought he was, he looked really, really young, but, but he, I thought he'd come from university, done a degree, come and done it, but he'd actually been a chef for 20 years. If I'd known that, I would have used more of those examples when I was talking and things like that. So it's about not making assumptions about existing knowledge and skills. There's so many ideas about they've got gaps in their knowledge, bet they know a whole lot about something else that you can use in your lectures. These fixing relationships is really important. Initiating relationships, maintaining and fixing them, saying, look, uh, if someone's really unhappy about an assessment, it's about sorting it out. And sometimes sorting it out can be a short conversation, five minutes, but can make a massive difference to the feeling around that course. Um, so it really is initiating relationships with students, generally. I <laughs> have to be careful with what I'm saying there. Also, it's letting them know you. Um, so it's, it's sharing your passion and your story. So that's why I talk about this is where I come from. I come from Northland. I'm really proud of it. I love where I come from. And, I, and it's about letting them know you, and not just a little introduction for two minutes at the start, going, oh, now that reminds me of the time when I was in the sand in Muscat, and this is what happened. Nothing really much to do with algebra or whatever I'm talking about. But it's... it's, it's allowing them and letting them to know you're going, gosh, I have no idea the answer to that question. But hang on, I'm going to write that down. I'm going to go away and think about it. Can anyone email me if you've got any ideas? So it's, it's being very real and human and sharing your passion and your story. One of the things that I've learnt from Ian, do you want to talk about this, oh, Ian? This is one of my favourite things about Ian. I learnt this from him. I've worked, I've worked with uh, trainee teachers. Are we on? Yeah. I've worked with trainee teachers uh, since 1996, um, and uh, there hasn't been a year gone by when I haven't had at least one trainee teacher working with me. And I give the same piece of advice to every single one of them. Stand at the door at the start of the lesson and at the end of the lesson. Now, that does it, two things. Firstly, um, especially if, you, if you've got 600 people in your lecture, you can't learn everyone's name. But if you just stand at the door and say, hello, hello, welcome, are they think that you know them and care more about them. You probably do care about them. But, and as you leave, thank you, thank you. They all say thank you. If you stand here, they will thank you. Um, in a high school setting, that's really important because if they're saying thank you, they'll behave better the next day. Um, and in, in th this setting, it's one way of actually having an, an, a, some sort of relationship with them, even if it's you saying thank you and, and them saying thank you as well. That's an easy, easiest thing to do. And being approachable is really important. Having that, those office hours and meaning it and, um, and 
saying hi to them around campus and stuff. Being approachable and knowing that you care is really important. And the fourth one is that proactive monitoring of students. I'm a big, I love statistics. I was a statistician back in the day. And I monitor students' grades. I look at differences between them. I am constantly, and I go back and look at their grades from last year if I'm worried about it. E-vision is a marvellous thing. And it's timely interventions. And yes, with 600 students or 400 students or 200 students or just students, you very rarely have time. Um, but it's, it's they, one of the lovely things, another Ian one, is they won't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So that's a really important thing. Um, another thing is, and John McGlashan did this, and um, show me you care. So that's the, do you want to talk about that a bit? We've only got about 27 seconds. Um, it was a bit of a mission to have one school rule. Um, schools are filled with bossy rules, such as tuck your shirt and know you play, shut your face, and all of that sort of thing. Um, but we had one school rule was show me you care. And then we had to break that down. Show me you care about your learning, your achievement, your friends, your family, your teachers, your planet, your environment, all of that, so your heritage, all of that. Show me you care about those things. And then you use the keyword by. By. Tucking your shirt and doing your homework, um, <laughs> and behaving in class, and all of those things. But you, you've got to care about your own future. Um, and that, that I, I swear, within, within that was just a 3 a.m. Um, idea that I had. We fleshed it out a bit as a staff. That transformed the culture of the school within a week. It was amazing. And it's the reason I sent my care. child to that school, I must say. That was that, those, those four um, words was what made me decide to send my child to that school. And show me you care. It's when I think about lecturing, I go, how do I show my students that I care? What do I do? What is my behaviours that show my, stu my, my students that I care? Um, the other thing is, is really being aware yourself of university pastoral care systems. Um, the Pacifica Māori student support is excellent and um, things like that. Knowing the systems, knowing the people behind those systems is really, really important. That you can refer students quickly, early, talk to them. They know their students well. Um, things like that. Um, and having strategies in place for monitoring and responding to students who aren't engaging. They're the ones that sit at the back making darts or whatever they're doing. They're the ones who are doing their um, online all the time and they're not really engaged. And it, it's, it's often it's me, sometimes it's me, I, st I teach from the back and I'm down the back sitting next to that student going, hey, wake up, I'm right here, <laughs> when I'm still talking and things like that. And it's, and it's not being authoritative about it, it's come on, let's go, shall we? <laughs> so let's, let's get on with this learning. So it's all of those things, it, it, they're subtle and they're not about your, well, notice we haven't talked about know your stuff. You've got to know your stuff. It's not about that. It's about the relationships with the students that are really important. So those are the four things that um, Ian and I came up with. There's a whole lot of references there and we're welcome. We're happy to share this with anyone. But they're the four things and we'll just sort of um, go back over them again. It's that providing of quality teaching, really quality teaching where you're well structured and, um, and you're, you're employing techniques with active learning. Um, and really being explicit about your role and the, all the meta-learning that goes with that, the study techniques, the examples, the, um, the scaffolding in semester one, I think that's really powerful. Um, building relationships with your students and um, the proactive monitoring of students and making timely interventions. They're used to the dean talking to them about, hey, I'm worried about your learning, a teacher told me this. So we've got to actually understand that's where they've come from and do a bit of that ourselves. It's very hard when we're trying to do 40% research, 20% service, isn't it? Whoa, as an emerging academic, that's my hardest thing. <laughs> it's about 80% teaching at the moment. Okay, so it's 12 o'clock on the dot. We've run out of time. It's lunchtime. And if, if you like, we can welcome to come around and talk to Ian and I about anything. Sorry we didn't have time for questions at the end. But thank you very much for coming, and I appreciate it.